from the American Conservative and the R Street Institutes. This runs about two hours. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, apologize for, I apologize for the lack of uh, seating in the room, although we're heartened to see so many people interested in this topic. Uh, I'm Lewis McCrary. I'm executive editor of the American Conservative. And I want to thank you for joining us this evening as we discuss the future of traditional urbanism. Uh, this event is a joint initiative of the American Conservative, a magazine based here in Washington, and the R Street Institute, uh, a center-right think tank also based here in town. Uh, I want to thank, take a moment to thank Hillsdale College, uh, Kirby Center, um, for sponsoring us uh, to use this great facility. Um, this event is also being broadcast on C-SPAN, so I want to thank them for being here as well and thank those who are joining us on, on C-SPAN for this discussion. Um, and in that vein, I'd like to also ask our audience here in-house uh, the usual reminder to silence your cell phones, although uh, we do encourage live tweeting, if you're so inclined, um, at the hashtag hashtag conservative urbanism. So if something strikes you that you wish to tweet about, I'll try to use that hashtag, hashtag conservative urbanism. And I also hope you'll take a moment uh, when you get home later or now, especially if you like what you hear today, to follow both the American Conservative and the R Street Institute on Twitter, Facebook. You can also find our websites. In addition, the new urbanism initiative of the American Conservative um, sponsoring this event has our own Twitter account, at New Herbs, which I encourage you to follow. Um, I'd like to thank our donors and sponsors who have made this, both this event and the continuing New Urbanism program possible. Uh, Tom Wilbur, the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation based in Chicago, the Bradshaw Knight Foundation, and Dominique Watkins. Uh, thank you for your support of this event and the New Urbanism Program. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, our American Conservative board member who's in the audience, Howard Amundsen, and I believe I saw Scott McConnell here somewhere as well, our founding editor. Um, and I'd also like to take a moment to thank the people who are less visible, both of the staffs of the R Street Institute and the American Conservative, especially Emil Joke and Caroline Kitchens for helping put this event together. Um, so first, before we get started with the panel, a bit of background on uh, the New Urbanism Initiative at the American Conservative. Three years ago, about this time in 2014, the American Conservative, I think, does what it always does best, which is to challenge um, status quo thinking among, among conservatives in a particular policy area and challenge whether continuing the same course was good for the country, its community, and, our, and ordinary citizens. So when the magazine was founded in 2002, for those of you who don't know, the issue of the moment was the coming Iraq war and the resources that would be wasted on that ineffective intervention abroad. And at the time, some on the left, left warned that Washington would come to regret that, but the American conservative was essentially the only voice on the right cautioning against uh, that intervention. So fast forward to 2014, and many of our editors and contributors realized there was a similar domestic issue in which the current approach pursued by our government at all levels, state, local, and federal, and shortly we'll be hearing from a local government official, would lead to a long-term weakening um, of our body politic and a reduction in the health and wealth of Americans. And that issue, the state of our built environment and the quality and form of the places in which we live, work, and raise our children is the one that we're here to talk about today. So to put this in some larger context, I think since the end of World War II, there's been clearly a dramatic reshaping of our built environment, and not just in the cores of our big cities, but in our smaller towns and suburban neighborhoods as well. And much of this change was, of course, set in motion uh, before the war by the mass-produced automobile, but certainly after, as the greatest generation returned home to give birth to the really large baby boomer generation, this set off a great demand. New, much new housing had to be constructed. But the federal government played, and I think it should be of interest to conservatives, played an increasingly prominent role in 
shaping this built environment by helping uh, create incentives to create vast new swaths of suburbia in this kind of cul-de-sac style uh, neighborhood format that many generations and many of us have probably grown up in with large new shopping malls, office parks surrounded by acres of parking lots, which, which aim to replace these old main streets and downtown commercial areas. And that great uh, Republican icon, Dwight Eisenhower, of course, created the, the interstate highway system known as the, really officially, the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways that once and for all made the car, I think, the preferred mode of transportation, not only between metropolitan, area, metropolitan areas, but reshaped them as well, allowing people to have these big, long, exurban commutes and, as a result, destroying a lot of these long-established neighborhoods. And at the same time, um, federal urban renewal programs encouraged cities across the country to engage in misguided what was then called slum clearance, creating these big, now infamous housing projects where people in poverty were isolated and um, faced rising crime. And, and some downtowns in you know, medium and large cities never recovered from this brutal surgery that removed much of our, our cultural heritage. Um, and along the way, I think there were dissenters from this project, which was largely largely a bipartisan effort among those in power, and perhaps the most prominent, who some will certainly know in the audience in the 1960s was Jane Jacobs, author of the now famous Death and Life of Great American Cities, who, who successfully stopped this lower Manhattan expressway project from, blowing, or from plowing right through the uh, dense urban neighborhoods there. And she and others, unfortunately, weren't able to save the great um, Beaux-Arts masterpiece in Midtown Manhattan Penn Station, which met a wrecking ball in 1964. And by the way, there's now an effort to, to among some conservatives and others, to try to rebuild that um, great space, which others and I have written about. So please, please check out those articles online. So I think the next step in this movement is later on then in the 1980s, after this initial reaction, um, some people began to engage not just in protest and reaction to what was happening to the landscape of our cities and towns, but work to create a positive kind of agenda that would involve local governments, private real estate developers, uh, in a way that could rediscover some of these older, more humane ways of building for places for people to live and work. And that movement, uh, the Congress, eventually became known as the Congress for the New Urbanism, and it's just celebrated 25 years of success um, both in doing new development and restoring an old urban fabric um, that creates the kind of places many people actually want to live, whether they're suburbs of metro areas or in older core neighborhoods of larger cities. And I'm happy to say that the new urbanists uh, who we've been working now for, for three years on this project, though they tend to have more left of center politics, are generally happy to have conservatives who support a more humane environment as fellow travelers in this movement. So. Um, so here we are today, three years into this, uh, what we've called the New Urbanism Initiative, this project, and I think we're really, the American Conservative is still the first and still only outlet on the right to take these issues of our built environment very seriously. And in the past three years, we've published both in our, our print magazine, online on these issues. I think we've basically pursued two strands of inquiry, um, ways of looking at this issue, which I hope can frame our discussion with our panelists today. And, I see these two strands. First, um, first, more of a cultural one. So how people imagine the built environment, their place within it, um, and how they can tap into sort of these great lost traditions of architecture and urban design that at least before World War II, I think made our cities, towns, and suburbs great places to live. And as conservatives, I think we're called here to try to work out how families can thrive in more dense urban environments, perhaps with only one family car or living with less exurban type amenities. And so reimagining how can we make this a reasonable choice for more than kind of the bourgeois bohemians to, to borrow from um, that phrase made very famous by David Brooks. Um, and then secondly, the kind of second strand that I think we'll address today beyond the kind of larger cultural st strand of how we reshape this conversation is, is public policy. Um, and I think that's at least a couple of people on this first panel will focus on that area, and that involves creating a regulatory environment and promoting infrastructure that at least allows for walkable urbanism. So a lot of our 
infrastructure now um, really excludes that possibility even as a choice for folks. So sometimes this involves re removing regulations like strict parking minimums that inhibit walkable types of development, um, or removing things that actually allow mixed use developments where people can again live kind of above the store um, as they've often done for centuries before you know, the last 50 or 60 years, which essentially made that illegal in a lot of places. And it also means building more housing, period, um, especially urban housing in metro areas, which many families who want to live in these places are priced out of, especially in expensive markets like San Francisco and Washington and Boston and New York, um, places like this. So um, hopefully that creates a kind of um, framework to start our discussion with our initial panel. Um, I want to introduce our panelists as we get started. Um, our first panelist initially to my left is Jason Segedy, who's the Director of Planning and Urban Development and Assistant to the Mayor in the City of Akron. Um, and he previously was the Director of Akron's Metropolitan Area Transportation Study, um, overseeing all the transportation funds in Greater Akron. And I understand he's been a longtime reader of TAC which I'm happy to hear that we have readers in Akron. Um, our second panelist uh, to the left of Jason is Gracie Olmsted, who I'm proud to say is a former uh, colleague of mine at the American Conservative, now the associate managing editor of The Federalist and the Thursday editor of Bright, a weekly newsletter for women. And uh, you can also her read her writing um, besides in the Federalist and the American Conservative of the Week, Christianity Today, and Catholic Rural Life. Um, and Gracie will talk to us um, today in part about um, how, how all of these lessons apply also to smaller towns and rural areas and how these lessons are really a continuum. They're not just lessons for big cities. Um, and then finally, um, unfortunately, Michael Hendricks had a family emergency and had to cancel, but um, I'm happy to say that my former colleague, Jonathan Coppage, um, who represents R Street, the co-sponsor of this event, and is the visiting senior fellow with the R Street Institute, will be stepping in. Um, at R Street, John researches urbanism and the built environment, and he previously is he's also another former colleague at the American Conservative, where he's senior staff editor, and uh, initially started this whole new urbanism initiative three years ago. Um, around this time today. So um, thank you to all of our panelists for being here. And I think um, what we'll do is start with Jason uh, maybe giving us some remarks. Jason, I, we're happy to have here because um, unlike some of us journalists and other think tank types, he actually runs planning in Akron, Ohio, right at the center of the Rust Belt. And uh, I think can tell us what's going on there out in Ohio and give us a lot of lessons for um, how we can actually practically fix things in places like that. So Jason, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here uh, in DC with all of you. Um, I think when Lewis and I were talking before, I was just gonna offer up a couple of thoughts as we start to frame um, the discussion. So I think in a lot of our cities, in particular in my part of the country, um, what we're seeing in a lot of ways is what I would call the end of big. The idea that these big, um, whether they're big corporations, big government, big plans and projects um, are going to save us. And so I think if you look at the trajectory of what's happened in a lot of our cities, particularly in the Rust Belt, um, as Lewis said, you know, urban renewal was one of those big kind of top-down command and control strategies that was supposed to revitalize us. Well, fast forward 40, 50 years, that didn't happen. Um, I think the next step in a lot of our cities was what I would call this prosperity theology of building casinos and stadiums and um, you know convention centers. And not to say that those things aren't important. In some cases, we can probably all point to projects that um, probably should have never been built. But they have their place, but I think the idea that this silver bullet um, project is going to save your city. You know, people will build a convention center. Step two is question marks, and step three is success. And you know, we don't necessarily have a plan to get from here to there. And then I think, particularly in Ohio and Michigan, 
um, and other parts of my part of the country. Lately, I think a lot of people have adopted what I would call um, kind of a predestination theology, which is the idea that we need to shrink and that, you know, the only hope for us is to basically shut down our cities. And I'm not a big fan of that approach. I think there, it is important to be realistic about the market and about some of our challenges. We have incredible assets in our part of the country. I always make the case in Akron, we're a city of 200,000. We've got 4 million people within an hour drive. I refuse to believe that we can't, um, with some good planning and place making, get 0.01% of those people back into the city and start to increase our population. So I think that's a matter of um, how do we go about doing those things. Just one other quick thought. I think um, a lot of what, with the uh, rubric of conservatism, a lot of the discussion that's kind of morphed over the last 20 years is, um, I think it was always a stereotype to some degree, but that conservatives were always pro-suburb and anti urban, but I think a lot of people, suburban and urban today, are kind of craving a sense of community and a sense of place, and I think that goes back to what I was saying about um, big versus small um, and manageable, and so I think there is actually a lot more common ground out there than a lot of people um, might first think. I think some of the ideas maybe um, that conservatives could reconsider with cities would be you know, in our part of the country, and this is true in a lot of the Midwest and Northeast, local government is extremely fragmented, and it gets very difficult um, to have any sort of regional cooperation. But I think, you know, there are good government practices of sharing services, consolidating things. I think that's something we have to explore. And then, you know, there was, I remember I was part of a sustainable communities project that the Obama administration had provided funding through HUD and DOT and EPA on. Um, we had a lot of Tea Party people come to those meetings and say that we were communists and we were setting up a totalitarian regime in Northeast Ohio. But I think within you know, some of that noise that was coming up, you know, there were real, real concerns about, you know, or, or is the government gonna come in and tell people where to live? My opinion is we need to make cities competitive and have people want to come and live in them, not prohibit people. I think that's something that's very different in our part of the country than the coast. You know, here, um, a lot of real estate issues are it's so expensive. In Akron, I could sell you a really, really nice house for $150,000, and I'll even sell you a lot for two hundred. We have 14, 1,400 of them that the city owns. So um, just some thoughts, but I think, I guess in, in closing with this part of it, thinking about you know, the shared challenges and the shared opportunities in different parts of the country and how we move forward. Well, I've had the distinct blessing of living in several different parts of the nation and several different sorts of neighborhoods, which I think gives you kind of a boots on the ground experience with what's happening in a lot of American communities. I grew up in a farmhouse between fields and then moved to an Alexandria condo on a third floor in one of the most walkable neighborhoods in America, which was lovely. Um, spent some time in a World War II era suburb and got to see the impact that that divide from the walkable nature of a downtown had on kind of the community life of that suburb and now have the great blessing of living in a Victorian fixer-upper with a front porch. Um, and in that time, having had a child, I think it's also amazing how having someone small that you push around in a stroller changes your relationship with the street and makes it both very intimate and very terrifying, depending on where you live. But one thing that Jane Jacobs said in The Life and Death of the American City, or American Cities, is that she thought what she was writing was applicable mainly to large cities, that it was applicable to places where people didn't know each other, where you interacted with strangers on a daily basis. And I would argue that that is true of most places in America today. Unfortunately, a lot of small towns and suburbs no longer have the sort of social fabric that leads them to feel 
that they have a community, that they know the people they pass on a daily basis. There's no longer that sort of serendipitous meeting at the grocery store or on your way to the bank or wherever it might be. So my argument would be that what we see in Jane Jacobs' work is more applicable, not less, to more communities outside of the large city. And of course, we can fix some things via cultural and social means. However, I do think there's a way in which we can build an environment that encourages people to spend time together, which leads me to a story, actually. My great-grandfather and his siblings grew up on a farm. There were seven of them. And um, they had a farm in which the cornfield was right next to the watermelons, uh, the watermelon patch. And they would steal through the cornfield every day after school and steal a watermelon and bring it back into the cornfield and eat it and just make sure their mother wasn't watching. So when they were adults, they went to her and apologized and said, Mother, we're so sorry. We lied to you and stole those watermelons. And she said, why do you think we planted the watermelons next to the cornfield? <laughs> Which is a long way of saying we can foster serendipitous fellowship via a built environment. And I think that's becoming, <laughs> becoming increasingly important in current days and days to come. Well, thank you. I love that story. <laughs> I'm going to have to steal it. Um, and thank you, Lewis, for putting this together. Um, this is really an extraordinary event and an extraordinary uh, crown for this discussion. Having spent the past few years working at this peculiar intersection of urbanism and conservatism, um, I, I've heard a lot of things. I've heard that conservatives don't like cities. They don't want anything to do with cities. And they would just as well cities disappeared. Um, and that's sometimes true. <laughs> I've heard that cities don't like conservatives, that they don't want conservatives, and would just as well if they disappeared. And that's often true. But um, what I've also come to understand and is just how many of us are in so many places and how for all the reputation that cities get of being um, monocultures of liberalism, the essential tenets of conservatism, of an attitude towards preserving traditions, of an attitude towards strengthening um, people's agency, those are present in cities. And party labels may come and go, but conservatism is very present. And what we have seen, as Lewis described, is a built environment that was not planted well in many places, um, but rather was driven apart. And so we saw many cities torn apart by interstate projects that um, snaked through intentionally uh, poor working class neighborhoods, uh, black neighborhoods, in an idea of progress. Because highways are good, so more highways are better. And highways in cities have to be just as good as highways outside of them. Um, we saw a lot of enthusiasm that destroyed a lot of good architecture, a lot of good urbanism. And in many cities in America, you see them starting to try and repair trying to put pieces back together. And there are places where it's happening. One of the great um, sites of that is the city of Detroit, where it is, it is as bad as its reputation gives you to believe. It has gone through things that no other city in America has, and it has gone further down. But in Detroit, in all of that darkness and all of that trouble, there has been a spirit of people who move into a house that you can get for not even $150,000, but $150, um, and fix it up. Who then fix up the next house. And, you know, for not much money, they can get a block, a parcel. And over the years, they can work at fixing them, at inviting neighbors in at creating neighborhood where they are and you know, engaging in the act of civilization, of um, 
taking a place where no one lived and making it fit for people to live again. Um, and that's a great thing to see. And you see that in many places across the country, many downtowns. If you go to Indianapolis, it uh, 30 years ago looked at itself and said, we are no place. We are a suburb that is designated as a metropolitan area. And it invested in its downtown because it knew that it needed a core. It knew that it needed a place for people to come and gain their identity and come to know each other. Um, and so in places as, and then you, you, know, you see places like New York where I'm guessing a lot of people in this room remember New York in the 1980s and the 1990s when films such as Escape from New York were made. And um, the dystopian was far more imaginable than the bursting concentration of economic activity, of arts, of vitality that represents New York City today. Um, and so what's important to realize as we're looking forward is just as the vision that the big planners who thought that they were going to fix everything could not anticipate their um, mistakes, so too a lot of the ideas that we have about what necessarily must come will not come to place. What will happen is that people will be citizens and activity will happen. And we can either help that by encouraging the built environment to be better and to conduce towards community or we can make it worse and make it harder for that. And so I'll just close by mentioning that in some places like Akron, you know, Jason has written extensively about how there are strong demand side problems of you need to bring people in. Um, in the places that have come back and have revitalized, like New York, uh, like San Francisco, like Seattle increasingly, um, there is a supply problem. And in these places where people are gathering to conduct economic activity, social activity, arts, it is so attractive that many people are coming in, but the regulations that Lewis described accumulated over the decades and made it impossible to build new places for them. And so in thriving places, there is a supply crisis in this country. And if there's anything that conservatives should understand, it is a supply side problem. <laughs> so there is an opportunity for us to step in and to take forceful leadership to say where there is economic activity, people should be able to go. And where there are demand side problems, we should invite people to come in. Great. Well, that's a great introduction to start us off. And um, maybe we could address some of the, what are some of the practical things that are being done, particularly, Jason, maybe you could tell us a bit more about how are you addressing this, as John puts it, the supply side problem. Are you actually able to compete with the, you know, Washingtons and Seattles and places like that? Or what's the, what's the kind of medium term set of goals for a place like Akron in the Rust Belt? I think one of the luxuries a place like Akron has is I don't think we have to exactly compete with, you know, we'll never compete on those terms or I think it's not even necessarily that healthy to see it as a competition. Each of these cities, I think, historically had a niche for why it is where it is. And I think being the best city that you can within um, that niche, you know, one of the one of the challenges in Akron that I'm confident we can overcome um, over time and with applying some um, good practices is we don't have a lot of demand right now, but a lot of that is we don't have a lot of demand for the supply that we have. So Akron was the fastest growing city in the United States between 1910 and 1920. We tripled in population. And if you think about what was going on between 1910 and 1920, that was the automobile. We built half of the tires on planet Earth in that decade and the decades following that. Um, the typical house in Akron is a 1914, you know, two-story wooden frame house with a front porch for a rubber worker. So in a lot of cases, that was a great house in 1914. Fast forward 103 years, 
It's, you know, some of the neighborhoods where that house is still attractive, they've already been fixed up. Um, we tear down 500 houses every year in the city of Akron. Um, those houses sell for, that's where we get into Detroit prices, you know, $10,000, $4,000. We're the most affordable housing market in the 100 largest metros in the United States, which is an awesome thing, except if you want to make money building something or rehabbing a house. Because I'm not a math whiz, but if you buy a house for 10 grand, put 80,000 into it and sell it for 40, that's not a real good return on investment. <laughs> so I think what we have to do is how do we work with that supply and demand framework uh, I'm proud to say three weeks ago, we launched um, citywide 15-year property tax abatement. If you build a new house in Akron, you will pay zero property taxes on that house for the next 15 years. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to equally encourage building in every single part of the city, but I think it is a powerful tool. Another thing that we're doing is, you know, our zoning code, like a lot of cities in the United States, regulates heavily um, the use of land, but not so much what things look and feel like. So if you want to put a barber shop next door to a house, it's going to be incredibly difficult. If you want to build a dollar store 100 yards off the street with a giant parking lot, no problem. So I think the thing that we have to do is kind of turn that on its head, make it easier um, for people to have more flexible use but make it a little bit more stringent about what things look and feel like. Because like a lot of cities, we've lost a lot of our historic urban form to becoming a very um, suburban looking place. And then I think one of the big opportunities that we have that not a lot of cities um, on the coast have is because land is fairly inexpensive and a lot of the, inf we have a ton of infrastructure in the city of Akron and the same would go for Cleveland and Detroit. Um, Etc. We were kind of at the leading edge of the freeway building boom. Um, traffic congestion, I laugh when friends and colleagues say we have traffic, we have no traffic, my commute's nine minutes. Um, and so I think the opportunity we have right now, we're in the midst of a teardown of one mile of urban freeway um, in the core of the city. The freeway was built for 100,000 cars in the 70s, it was never finished, it carries 20,000 cars. About 10 years ago, I think we made the good decision not to double down on that awful investment that should have never been made. Um, and right now we're tearing that freeway out. It's gonna free up 30 acres um, that we could redevelop as either a linear park, as some mixed use, maybe as a little bit of both. So I think we do have a lot of opportunities if you know where to look for them. Um, and it's more a matter of being the best city we can. And I think if we do that, we will be attractive to people. I wonder if, uh, coming off of that, if we could come back a little bit to, to the cultural side, um, the importance of place, how that attracts people and creates a sense of value. Um, does anybody want to comment on Jason? Well, I think one problem that relates to that, of course, is that as, and this is a problem in a lot of small communities that I've seen and interacted with, that as larger cities, uh, you know, the San Francisco's of the world, attract people, uh, what happens to the smaller communities surrounding them? Usually they become suburbs, you know, a lot of them experience that transformation from once being a very vibrant rural town to becoming a bedroom community for people who buy their groceries elsewhere, who buy their um, everyday needs elsewhere, who go ahead and go to church in the city as opposed to going to church locally. And in addition, a lot of their local businesses suffer. And so they're trying to answer the question of how do we make ourselves unique, vibrant, um, powerful, both socially and economically, when all of our resources are being drained from us and they have this feeling of kind of becoming faceless. And so I do think it's interesting to see how a lot of the zoning and regulations issues in place and a lot of the money that goes into suburban development, I believe can and should be redirected into the small town's built environment surrounding its downtown, the old houses that are already there, trying to rejuvenate the spaces that exist and making them places that people want to live so that all of those resources aren't just being pulled away from what's already been created and that's already beautiful, but just needs a little bit of help but continues to build a community that was once strong, but is now starting to fall apart. John, I wonder if you could talk to us some about some of the perverse 
incentives that are in place in terms of that have been set up over the years in terms of federal financing, how we spend money for infrastructure. Um, we actually had a piece in the American Conservative, the issue before last, I think it might be the one you have in your chair, about how we can, if we have a new big infrastructure bill, what it can do to at least create a level playing field for infrastructure that's friendly towards walkable urbanism, those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the great challenges that we are encountering now is um, just how much infrastructure, as Jason was describing, was built in very peculiar times. Um, and for most of America, it wasn't the rubber boom, uh, particularly, but it was the baby boom. It was when the greatest generation came home from World War II and settled the crabgrass frontier. The federal government had gotten involved from uh, the New Deal, uh, setting up institutions like the uh, Federal Housing Agency, and they got more involved. And they set up very specific um, targets and very specific institutions to create what they uh, wanted. And what they wanted was what was fashionable at the time, um, the dispersed suburb. Uh, where you would separate everything out. As uh, Jason was describing, uses were regulated very closely because nobody wanted um, a tire factory in the middle of their uh, single family residential neighborhood. And so they you know, wrote these very crude regulations. Um, what they did not account for were what you were discussing earlier is that traditional Main Street, where you have a little more density, where um, you can have an apartment over the storefront. And during the day, the grocer looks out and keeps an eye on the home. And at night, the people keep an ear out in case anyone is threatening or breaking into the shop. Um, this pattern was, there are many wisdoms to it. Uh, too many to list here, but it was the core of you know every American downtown until this point. Um, and because the federal financing standards would not uh, permit a mixture of uses, they saw themselves as residential only or commercial only, the funding, the financing dried up as the entire banking market moved to the direction that the feds were pointing. Um, and so this was just sort of dug up by some people who were wondering why we didn't build things uh, better. And this obstacle was discovered. And so I know that there are people on the Hill right now who are trying to figure out how they can fix the federal programs. Not so that incentives and subsidies can be poured into um, you know, a new preferred form, but rather so that the playing field can be leveled so that when people decide that they want to build something in their place, they can access the market and they can make that investment. And um, you know, in that article that you mentioned by Chris Leinberger, he described just the premium that walkable development has these days. And a lot of people who write about cities get this wrong of thinking that it's just about big cities. You're seeing densification everywhere you're seeing suburbs urbanizing because people want walkability, because people want to be able to walk to a store. Um, and the price premium is there. People will build it and people will come. The question is, if we are going to let the legacy cities, the cities that already exist, build it and let people come, or if we're going to keep pushing them further out. So I want to ask, and I'll open this up to anybody on the panel before we open it up for questions. Um, I think we all pretty much agree that you know, new urbanism is great, increasing walkability is great. I mean, there's a lot of movement. There's always a lot of pushback to all of these projects, and I'm sure Jason deals with this on the ground. John probably deals with it to some extent. Um, how do you respond to people who just don't want any change don't want an incre increased density, don't want the freeway removed. How do you make the case for this new vision of restoring walkable urbanism? 
Well, if uh, 20 years in local government has taught me anything, it's that people never like change. So I think that whatever the change is, you have to be kind of willing to be in it for the long haul, and you've got to be willing as a public official to listen um, and tweak things. I think there is wisdom um, in the crowds, maybe sometimes with individuals, it's a little bit more um, problematic. I think one thing this job has taught me is um, contrary to popular belief, Americans are very in favor of heavy, onerous government regulation of other people's private property. So, um, and that really does come up in the real world with zoning all the time. So, you know, in a lot of cities, Akron included, there's, you know, move to, you know, like Airbnb is a great thing. We have a huge and growing Nepali refugee community in the city of Akron, um, about six, 7,000. Um, Bhutanese and Nepali refugees strong. Um, Jason Roberts from the Better Block, who a lot of you might know, kind of, we did a, uh, the biggest Better Block in the United States in Akron two years ago. Jason fell in love with the neighborhood, created uh, what he called the Exchange House, which was rehabbing a house he bought for $22,000, making it a cultural center for the Bhutanese and doing an Airbnb. Airbnbs are getting more popular. Um, on the other hand, we do have people that rent out their houses for parties for like 150 people or weddings even. And so I think in the zoning code, most people would agree it's probably not reasonable in a single family neighborhood to have 150 people regularly hanging out in your front yard. Um, but an Airbnb where you have two people you know, and they're eating breakfast with your dog is probably okay. So how do we kind of navigate that? that environment right in a regulatory fashion. I think another thing, even in a city like Akron where um, traffic congestion is pretty much non-existent, certainly by DC or any other coastal standard. We've, our, our mayor, Mayor Horrigan, who I work for, has been really progressive with the idea of doing what we call road diets. So taking streets and roads that were built um, for far more traffic than they carry. The great thing, it's another luxury we have, is all we need to do is take paint and we can turn that four lane road into a three lane road with bike lanes. It's pretty easy to do. We will sometimes get pushback though from people of, you're taking away the lanes, it's gonna take me, and then they make up a number of how much longer they think it's gonna take to get somewhere. And what we were able to do with projects like the Better Block is when we did that project, we shrunk a five lane street to a two lane street with bike lanes. We actually measured all weekend the change in average speed of the traffic um, in Carmageddon didn't happen. It took maybe 12 seconds longer for people to get through there. So I think that's another thing in the planning profession that's really changing, which I think is great, is going back to the scientific method. You know, we've got a whole wonky industry of consultants and people that do traffic studies with these sophisticated um, computer models. That's how I started my career. But people never start to think like, why don't I have somebody stand outside and film traffic for an hour and see what it does when I get rid of a lane, you know? And so I think that's one of the things that is changing that's really healthy in the profession and making, making our cities better. And I think it eases, going back to what you asked, public perception, because you can actually demonstrate with um, lived real world experience. This is what happens when we do these different interventions. And you can learn what not to do. Sometimes they fail and you learn from that. Anybody else want to address that? One, John or Chris? I think harnessing local perception too is always going to be helpful just because people who live on a street know that street and they know the traffic on it. And I, I would argue that most Americans don't want a dead main street. They don't want their towns to be so heavily covered with traffic that they don't feel like they can walk along the street with their dog or with their children. Most people who live in these towns, if they understand the difference, the magnificent difference, I would argue, that happens when you take the street from the car and give it back to the townspeople, they're going to want that and they're going to fight for it. And in fact, I live in a community now that is fighting for its streets back from commuter traffic and is very staunchly advocating for wider sidewalks, which I hope will come to pass. But um, I think it all goes back to kind of re-educating all of ourselves because we've been raised in a generation that's very car-centric to ask the question, what is the street for? Um, what is the chief end of the street, so to speak? And, and it's community, it's not actually the car. The chief end of the street is not 
to give us heavier car traffic. It's to enable community however we can. And so I think that involves necessarily more pedestrians and more fellowship that happens by foot as opposed to by four wheels. Yeah. Um, I would also just indicate that you know, speaking of new urbanism, one of the great institutions for this is the charrette. Um, it is a, it is time intensive, um, but the people who do it well do it very well of gathering all stakeholders from an area together um, and just working through the issues of what you want your place to look like. Um, and it helps to be able to say, all right, here's a picture where something was done well. And people will say, well, we want that. And you'll say, but you were saying you want to ban that. And so that can get a conversation started at least. Um, you know, I, I won't sit up here next to Jason and be able to say that it ever is easy to get political input and buy-in. But government's not easy. Self-government, much less. Um, but for some people, they're able to push it through and they're able to make good things happen. Great. Uh, well, let's take the next 10 minutes or so before uh, our next panel and take some questions. I think we have a mic, so you could just wait for the mic, uh, identify yourself, and um, keep your questions short so panelists could respond. Then we'll be able to get in, hopefully, a lot of questions. Um, so why don't we start right over here? Hey there. So, uh, you know, a lot, as was mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the problems with you know, sort of uh, U.S. cities turning the sprawling pseudo, you know, suburban hellscapes is because, you know, government incentives pushed it that way. Um, so, you know, Houston has, like, parking requirements of any new building. You know, you, I think in certain places you have to build a certain distance from the sidewalk, which just reduces density and, you know, makes it more car-reliant. Um, so, and, but conservatives, you know, at least in the U.S., are are pretty, you know, ideologically opposed to spending and regulation. So do you think just taking away the government uh, could, would, will result in cities that reverse this, you know, more than half a century of rot? Uh, you know, we, I mean, light rail even is expensive, so. I think um, what we're dealing with in a lot of cases in, in cities across the U.S. is this is a very complicated, holistic, cultural, um, regimen, I guess you could say, that we've developed. So yes, government regulation is definitely a factor in how we build things the way we do. But I think when you're talking about how developers build, we've got 60, 70 years now under our belt of doing it a certain way. And so although I think changing regulation is certainly um, a great tool and we should do that more, I think a lot of times um, the building and development community, and it depends a lot on which city we're talking about, but um, a lot of times we'll want to build suburban style um, in a city. And then I think the third factor is what we were kind of talking about earlier is the public. So um, mixed use might sound like a wonderful idea to everyone in this room, certainly myself included. Um, the neighbors might feel differently. And so I think it's navigating those conversations kind of in the public sector, private sector, and in the citizens, citizenry um, at large. I think Jonathan alluded to this earlier that, you know, we kind of turned our back on 5,000 years of how to build cities. If you guys read Chuck Marone's uh, writings at Strong Towns, who's a great, um, you know, advocate of this, he was just in Akron last week, um, we really threw a lot of stuff out the window after World War II, and I think um, the country is going to be kind of repenting at leisure from a lot of the squandering of resources on that for a long time. Sorry, I think I missed the main point of question. Do you think we need <coughs> regulation in the opposite direction to make this? Oh, like uh, regulation to say not allow more parking to be built. That's a big debate. I mean, in Akron, for example, we just got, we had a downtown parking requirement. And for 30 years, no one was beating down the doors to live downtown. So it was kind of silly that we had that, but we got rid of it. So no longer do we force you to figure out 
um, to, to build a certain amount of spaces per unit. It was one and a half spaces per unit. Um, we did talk a lot about maximums instead of a parking minimum, parking maximums. I think the jury is still out in the literature and in cities on, um, there's, some, there's kind of a market urbanism argument against the maximum saying, well, now you're still, the government's intervening too much. Um, I think other people see it as kind of a necessary corrective. Um, my own thought is, at least in a market like ours, it's probably enough to just say, we won't force you to build too much parking. Great. But the gentleman over here, the green, green glasses. Uh, so one of the most robust findings in social science is that increasing density uh, you know, increases like leftist power like all over the world. Is there anything, is there like any evidence that increasing density will help Republicans? Is there any red city model, red state model? Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, because this is an event sponsored by the American Conservative, I have to first point out that conservative and Republican are not often and often aren't things that go together. Um, <laughs> But if you're looking at it from a partisan and Republican perspective, which, in fairness, we are in Washington, D.C., um, what's interesting to note is that w only one of the 20 largest American cities right now has a Republican mayor. That was not the case 20 years ago. Um, there has been a sorting that has taken place, and part of that is due to... Um, you know, we can speculate about a number of reasons for that happening, but a lot of it from folks that I've talked to is disinvestment from the parties. Uh, if you strengthen cities and you don't put any uh, resources or attention into cities, then the people who are paying attention to them will do better there. Um, I saw Jill Homan here, who is uh, one of the great people who is working uh, in the Republican Party to try and push back and actually have resources for people in cities who want to um, do policy work. There's been a great vacuum of policy work, and so it's not a surprise that if you're running and you don't have any ideas and none of your funders or none of your party infrastructure uh, cares about a place, that that place won't respond well to you. Um, but in places, in other places, you have seen very interesting models. Um, the recent mayor of Oklahoma City is a Republican who will soon be running for governor, I believe, and is a very interesting figure. San Diego um, acquired its Republican mayor through interesting means, but has one nevertheless. And um, I think, you know, you will find opportunities for good policy and people will respond to that when you have it to present to them. So you need something to offer people before they will give you their votes. Great, uh, let's take somebody in the back, the gentleman there with the glasses in the back. Uh, so a lot of the talk uh, we had up here were about cities that have, as you said, demand problems. Um, I'm actually on the Housing Commission in Arlington County, just across the river. Uh, we have a supply problem. Uh, so be, the, one of the more difficult things I've run into when talking to residents, beyond just straight up nimbyism, either people's understandings of the relationship between more housing supply and what effect that has on house prices. The people who understand supply and demand have a really strong incentive to not allow more housing in their neighborhoods. The people who don't understand supply and demand see new development, see that it tends to be more expensive than old buildings, and conclude that development is the reason why things are so expensive. So if we just stop building, prices will become more affordable. Uh, where the causation is obviously, in most cases, the other way around, unless you've succeeded in destroying anything that makes it uh, attractive to live there in the first place. So I guess my question is, is that how do you either sell to an electorate that more supply generally deals with housing cost problems, 
slash how do you create incentives for existing property owners of why should you care that we're putting up a four unit small mid-rise place down the street as opposed to just restricting this to single family. Thanks. Um, and so I, I'll just jump in shortly to say that California is a very interesting model here because they're dealing with um, the worst housing crisis in the country. And what you're seeing is exactly a political coalition forming called Yimbyism um, that is attempting to uh, bring this market wisdom uh, and advocate for building while also being in dialogue, as you discuss, with the levers of power in cities. And they are, um, you know, they create coalitions that advocate for housing in any form, whether it's affordable subsidized housing or whether it's uh, market rate. Um, you know, the important thing is you have to have market rate housing. Um, the less of it you have, the more expensive everything else gets. And um, the more that people stop market rate housing, uh, the more that people are driven out of their homes. So that is a message that you have to drive home. Um, for the incentives, you know, there's a real governance issue here, and it's one that we may have to look seriously at, which is um, where we place veto power over um, the ability to create places for people to live and for people to, um, you know, do things with their own property. And we have placed that power at the most local level. Um, and as a dyed-in-the-wool American conservative localist, I am generally for moving all power to the local. Um, but as Americans, we have, as we see behind us, a great tradition of recognizing when incentives need to be balanced and when governmental structures need to allow ambition to check ambition and interest to check interest. And so it may well be that, especially in places with supply problems, we need to take a hard founding look at our governance structures. Okay. Probably got time just for one more question. Uh, maybe the gentleman in the back who's holding up the, the beer. <laughs> Thanks, hi. Uh, Sam Warlick, recovering New Urbanist, hi Lewis. Hi John. Uh, I wanted to um, bring back up John's Detroit example. John and I, were, we were in Detroit together. We saw some really amazing stuff. Uh, for anybody who hasn't been to Detroit lately, downtown Detroit has absolutely turned over in a profound way. And the other 138 square miles of Detroit haven't seen much change. So what I want to ask is, how do we build an urbanist movement going forward that is actually equal access, that actually brings, you know, economic growth, not just where the money wants to go, but to the places that need it the most. I want to know how we build something that isn't just making great places for the people who are going to live there next, but for the people who are going to live there now. I mean, that's a really great question. I think in a lot of ways that question is almost the flip side of the one about supply. And so, you know, in the Arlington example of people being very freaked out by new housing and what's that going to do. I think in my part of the country, Detroit certainly, um, it's almost been the opposite concern that people will read about gentrification in New York and San Francisco and anything new happens and that gentrification genie is out of the bottle and people are really worried about it. And that not to minimize um, the concerns that drive why people might feel that way, but you know, my response in my city when people say gentrification is that would be a really great problem for us to have. Um, and I think in a, I, I, I'm very familiar with this. I'm a lifelong Akronite other than my two year stint in grad school. I think our part of the country for a long time has been unrelentingly negative about the future of cities. And so people almost get this like weird Stockholm syndrome I don't know what you would, whoever coins the term um, should get an award for what it should be called, but where people are very afraid of, you know, I've heard people come to me and be like, they just opened a second coffee shop. Like, well, that's gonna put the other one out of business. It's like, it's good to have, 
to coffee shops. Like our problem is not that we have too many coffee shops or too much of anything. And so I think in a place like Detroit, going back to your question, what we have to navigate is the real concerns of the largely African-American low-income population that has been disenfranchised and had things done to it for a really long time with really legit concerns, but helping people see that getting more investment in the city is a good thing. And I think what makes it a challenging conversation to navigate is I don't think it's as simple as a rising tide lifts all boats, but when, you know, Joe, if you ever read Joe Courtright, some of his pieces, you know, he talks a lot about gentrification and poverty in places like Detroit. In his cases, there's been equality, inequality in Detroit for like 60 years. It's just all the wealth, none of it was in the 138 square miles before. So I think it is a difficult thing to navigate. I would be lying if I told you I know the secret sauce to um, revitalizing neighborhoods that haven't had investment in 40 or 50 years. But I think it does start with what I was saying earlier of starting to think small. You know, there's that famous Daniel Burnham quote about make no little plans. I think that quote has done the planning profession a lot of harm because I think in a lot of cases we did big stuff for 50, 60 years and in a lot of ways it brought us places like Detroit. I think we have to start thinking about local and ground up and, you know, restoring places built by the people that live there. Well, I think that's a great uh, place to wrap things up on this first panel. In just a minute, we're going to move right into our second panel. So we just ask you to bear with us. Thanks to all the folks who are standing in the back. I do notice there are a couple of extra seats in the front for anybody who's getting tired. Let's have a round of applause for this first panel. first panel and Jason and Gracie. Um, again, just let me say how grateful I am to all of you here and all of the people who have made this possible um, because I can tell you as someone who's gone across the country working on this, there are people everywhere who pop up who are conservative and who are interested in cities. And um, they have a lot of the questions that have been asked thus far, and they have a lot of the questions that we're now going to ask. And um, I can tell you that as long as I've been following urbanism as a policy area, uh, never have I seen such a commotion as on March 25th, 2017, when a columnist dared to write in the New York Times, break up the liberal city. Um, we are fortunate here to have uh, Ross Douthat, who has um, been engaging in a series of um, what he describes as implausible, uh, sometimes perhaps insane, but always interesting arguments to really get our uh, political and policy conversation going in new directions because I think everyone um, I've talked to has been dismayed by how even after great, after great political disruptions, it has continued in stagnant tracks. And so um, let me just read a little excerpt of it here and then kick off, <laughs> kick off our uh, conversation. Yes, we have Ross Douthat here, columnist for the New York Times, formerly of uh, The Atlantic, author of Grand New Party with Raihan Salam and Bad Religion. 
Um, we have Ben Schwartz with us, who is national editor of the American Conservative, uh, who has had a varied and distinguished career, including also at The Atlantic, where he was literary editor. And we have Aaron Wren, a senior fellow from the Manhattan Institute. Um, he it also runs the blog, The Urbano File. And um, in this cosmopolitan panel is our representative from real America. Um, Aaron grew up in a town of 50 people in rural Indiana. And so I'm looking forward to being able to have a robust discussion about um, American cities and the American polity and how they are relating to each other. So first, um, in March, Ross Douthat proposed that we should treat liberal cities the way liberals treat corporate monopolies, not as growth-enhancing assets, but as trusts that concentrate wealth and power and conspire against the public good. And instead of trying to make them a little more egalitarian with looser zoning rules and more affordable housing, we should make like Teddy Roosevelt and try to break them up. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And the reason why this was so interesting to me is coming off of this particular election in which we saw just how much of our population was concentrated in certain places uh, and how much of one particular political persuasion was concentrated in those places. And because of that super concentration, um, the popular vote, as you may have heard, did not match the electoral vote for one of the rare times in American history. And most people have decried that, but it has always struck me that that may be something akin to the system working. It was, after all, the Connecticut Compromise that put it in place, the Senate, the Electoral College, in order to try and balance uh, the nation against concentrated commercial wealth. Um, and so, let me just turn to you, Ross, and allow you to address these fine city folk. And um, why ought the city be treated like a trust and broken up, possibly? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. This is a wonderful event, and I'm honored and flattered to be here. Um, second, let me preface all of my remarks by saying, nope, OK. Second, um, if you missed it, I thank you all for having me. Um, <laughs> second, let me preface basically everything I say tonight by noting that I am a newspaper columnist, and the requ requirement of that job description is to make outlandish suggestions about areas in which you are generally underinformed <laughs> and to pretend to a higher level of knowledge than you can possibly have. Um, so I am not an urban policy person. I have never attempted to revitalize the city of Akron. Um, and I have lived in cities for much of my life. And in fact, I guess to sort of burnish my urbanist bona fides, I lived in right here in this neighborhood in Capitol Hill for um, about seven or eight years, and then we've been in sort of semi-rural Connecticut for about the last two years, and for various reasons, some of them having to do with ticks, um, that has been an unsuccessful experiment, and we will be returning to walkable urbanism in uh, New Haven, Connecticut this fall for at least a year. So um, I, am, I am an admirer, a fan, and an enjoyer of uh, walkable urbanism and urbanism in general. Um, that being said, uh, America's uh, biggest cities are bad, um, and they're bad in several different ways um, they, that are sort of effectively intertwined. Um, basically, one of the biggest stories in our society over the last 30 or 40 years since the 60s and 70s has been a socioeconomic, but in particular educational sorting, um, where you have the increasing concentration of college graduates and people with postgraduate degrees into a particular set of sort of knowledge economy, symbolic analyst cities, um, mostly on the East and West Coast and also in sort of around major colleges and universities uh, in the heartland. 
And this concentration has obviously upsides or people wouldn't be doing it. Um, urban cores are, as I've said, I've lived in them, I like them, they're wonderful places to live. Um, they have a lot of beautiful architecture that's much more attractive than split level ranches and sprawling cul-de-sacs. Um, and they bring people together uh, who work together and play together and go to coffee shops together. Um, and all of that has some kind of economic multiplier effect, you have to assume. The economists assume it does. It has some sort of innovation goosing effect. Um, and, uh, you know, and the people who do it like it. So those are all good things. Unfortunately, it also means that American society is effectively segregated by education and social capital as never before. And it's segregated in ways that have political consequences where the Democratic Party can claim 48% of the vote but then discover that all of that 48% is crammed into such a small geographical area that even if you undo every Republican gerrymander, you, you, know, you still might not get the representation that Democrats feel that they deserve. Um, and it has... And this also has consequences for Republicans because, as you were discussing before, it gives Republicans a disincentive to even compete in urban areas, which sort of blinds Republican politicians to the very important ins and outs of urban policy. It has that effect. Um, and it has related effects. It has the effect of you know, effectively pitting cities against cities in certain ways. So I have lived in Connecticut for the last two years. I grew up in Connecticut. Um, and Connecticut is having a lot of trouble these days because Connecticut is a state of small cities, um, which, you know, I, I like small cities. I grew up in one. I think they're in many ways more livable and humane than the biggest cities. Uh, but major companies and the sort of young, driven 20-somethings who they want to hire uh, don't necessarily want to live in small cities when there's a much bigger city available. And so what's happened to Connecticut cities, especially the ones that aren't lucky enough to have Yale University, has been a kind of departure. And you know, the most, and this has happened to Connecticut suburbs as well. But you know, for instance, the city of Hartford is, you know, was historically the insurance capital of the United States. Um, it was where you know, Wallace Stevens sold insurance and wrote poetry. Uh, and it, it's, a, you know, it's a beautiful city with a beautiful art museum, literary tradition, sits on a river, and so on, but uh, companies don't want to be based there anymore. And you know, recently, one of, the major, one of the last major insurance companies is moving one of its sort of innovation and young people and technology-focused offices to, where else? New York City, because New York City is a place that the young people they want to hire want to be, and it's also a place that is rich and getting richer and so can afford the tax subsidies and breaks and all the different things that lure vibrant companies into Chelsea or wherever, whereas Hartford with a, with a shrinking base of companies can't afford that. And that dynamic has what's played out between New York City and Boston and Connecticut in between them has played out in certain ways in the country at large where sort of the great urban revival in the United States is a revival of often megalopolises and not necessarily a revival of smaller cities that are in certain ways the places where I think a sort of conservative approach to urban policy would be more likely to flourish. Uh, and then the final issue here, and I won't talk about my solutions because they're all obviously crackpot ideas that, you know, I mean, that was the nature, as you said, of this column series, but the last issue uh, is, that, is that these cities are also um, population sinks, basically. Uh, they're places where people don't have kids. And that has implications for conservative politics because conservative politics tends to be sort of boosted by people who have children for various reasons. Um, but it also just has implications for the future growth of the United States, the future growth of the Western world. It has complicated implications that I've written other columns about for the polarization of our politics and how we think about racial and demographic change. It has a lot of unfortunate implications. And while I am supportive of a lot of the, uh, you know, the sort of, the, what you might call the urbanist consensus, right? This is, I think, what unites a lot of free market conservatives and sort of, you know, center-left policy wonks and so on. The idea that, you know, you have these big cities that are centers of economic growth, 
but they don't have enough housing, so nobody can move there. So they're not, you know, they're not effectively serving the kind of engine of working in middle class prosperity function that cities did 50 or 100 years ago. And San Francisco could be much more dense, and New York could be much more dense. I agree with all of that, sort of. But if you make San Francisco a lot denser, you're not going to be building the kind of houses. I mean, you could, but you're probably not going to be building the kind of houses where people are going to have three kids and live there for 20 or 25 years. You're much more likely to be building more of sort of the urban standard space, which is a good space to live by yourself or with a roommate or with a girlfriend or a spouse and maybe a good space to have one kid and maybe if you squeeze a good place to have two kids but it's really stressful and exhausting and so on and they're not you know they're they're not places in the long run where you know if you encourage more and more people to move to you're going to get any kind of reversal of what i think of as the negative demographic trends in the united states and the western world so while I can see the economic case for that consensus, and I basically support it, I think you also need to think outside the box a little bit more and think about the think about sort of the trajectory that this urban concentration takes us on politically in terms of polarization and partisan politics um, and sort of socioeconomically and culturally, both in terms of its effects on the rest of the country and on its effects on, you know, the life cycle and when people have kids, whether they have kids, when they get married and so on, um, which would lead me to a defense or a partial defense of suburbanization in the 1950s and 60s, but I've gone on long enough. So. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, that natalist penalty, um, Ben, you, for the American conservative, uh, wrote a cover story that was titled Cities Without Children, in which you engaged the patron saint of urbanism, uh, Jane Jacobs, and particularly her town, uh, you know, her, her little village. Um, and I was wondering if you could bring up um, that perspective to engage uh, the effects of cities on families and uh, what that means for cities going forward versus uh, the village that she inhabited. Right. Well, do do I need this yeah. as well? Well, uh, uh, the uh, the the in the last panel we heard a lot of talk about communities and how important communities are and and uh, uh, and connected with that family life, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, what uh, and that's really when you read Jane Jacobs, uh, you. Uh, uh, what you're really getting uh, is her, or what's most memorable, is her uh, sort of lyrical evocation of really a small town village life in the middle of New York City. And that was largely because she was describing a, a very peculiar neighborhood. It was a working class neighborhood that was essentially gentrifying. So it had all of the uh, advantages in terms of social stability of a working class neighborhood in industrial post, post-war New York with sort of the fun uh, 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 bohemian elements that, uh, that attract so many of those uh, young, innovative knowledge workers to uh, the cities. Uh, Who the, are good people. Yeah, they're, they're good yeah. people. Now, the problem is, though, I mean, as, as I see it, and I, 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 I hate to just, you know, but I'm, 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 a, 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 I'm a Marxist conservative. So I have to always, you know, uh, I, I always have to bring things back to uh, uh, the economic and social relations. And that, you know, that the reason that we, these communities that we love and that we're trying to get back were the products of certain uh, economic and social, and even gender realities, and just to throw just a you know this is going to uh, just just to say something outrageous. I mean, you can't have the community life that Jane Jacobs described, uh, or that, for instance, D.J. Waldy described a very similar community life in his book Holy Land on suburban on post-war suburban uh, uh, California. Uh, but you can't have that community life with the kind with the gender relations that we have now. This was dependent on women 
being at home during the day. Yes, the store owner did every now and then intervene uh, uh, when the children were running across the street, but it was most, mostly the eyes and ears on the street, and Jacobs makes this absolutely plain. It's the mothers. Uh, this was, and this was absolutely true in suburbia, the kind of suburbia that we all, that, that the suburban vision that we, uh, uh, that uh, is, is really quite enticing. Uh, you have, yes, you have kids playing in the cul-de-sac, you have kids running from, from, uh, from yard to yard, uh, but there are uh, women at home minding the children. Uh, now, I'm not at all suggesting that we go back to that era, uh, but I'm saying that if you want that community, you, that community life was the product of, a, uh, of an economic reality that uh, I think is banished. And I don't have to be, since I'm not an urban planner, I don't have to come up with any solutions. I see no solutions. I see the kind of, uh, uh, I, I think certainly the, the, the major urban centers are going to be increasingly uh, that, uh, 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 and, in, uh, and intensely uh, uh, centers of, of, of hip young knowledge workers. Democrat or Republican, their, their, their politics is in some ways incidental. But there's no way that they are going to be havens for middle class or a working class life. Um, even though, I mean, and, and this is even, makes things even more pessimistic. Uh, if you look at Charles Murray's book on, uh, he was really talking about the sorting that, that, that Ross is very eloquently describing. My God. You, you couldn't get back to that working class life because the working class doesn't, it, um, could not, uh, uh, it's arguable whether it could support the, family, the, the, the family life and community life that it did back then. So uh, I think a lot of this is really an exercise in nostalgia. Uh, and again, it's very nice for the, uh, for the very, for the most privileged among us to be able to walk to Pete's Coffee, but that really doesn't give us the kind of community and family life that Jacobs evoked and that presumably a lot of us want to get back to. Final point, yes, everyone says they want those, those even in the small towns, the middle-sized towns, they want, the, uh, the, they want to be able to walk to the stores. You look at what, what was New York, what was the streetscape of New York Again, the most sophisticated cosmopolitan city in the country. What was it like in the post-war decades? It was basically this, this dreadful monopoly or, or monotony of shoe repair stores, hardware stores, and dry cleaners. You know, it served, again, it served this local population. But there were, yes, there were some antique stores. There were some, you know, used bookstores. There were some cafes. It was mostly... You know, it was mostly local people leading their local, in some ways, extremely parochial lives. These neighborhoods were really very self-contained. Um, so, but now you get it, that's just, we can never go back there. We can't go back there in, I live in a small town in New Hampshire. Uh, there's no, the, the downtown, it's lovely, it's bucolic, it's, uh, it's charming. The downtown just has boutiques that essentially serve tourists. Uh, now, even if a hardware store, and everyone's, I would say, I would love to go to that hardware store. I'd love to just walk to that hardware store downtown. I'd love to walk to that hardware store, but I spend all my time at Home Depot because Home Depot, there's, Home Depot is going to have the, the selection and the price that as a consumer I need, or at least I want. Uh, so, you know, if you want, and again, that's an important distinction, if you want to, you can't return to that small town life uh, and you can't return uh, to those sort of blissful uh, urban neighborhoods. All right, thank you. And so, Aaron, you're in a very interesting perspective to comment on this because, I, as I mentioned, you grew up in a very small town. Um, you know, the smallest of small towns. Uh, you then uh, spent time in Indianapolis, uh, Chicago, and now um, ply your wares in New York City. So uh, Ben has just described how we are not going back um, to a previous era of nostalgia. Where are we going forward? What's the future of the American city? That's a good question. 
Uh, I think one of the things that uh, I really took away from Ross's piece on breaking up the liberal city is the status quo is not an option. And although his particular recipe, uh, which I think is more of a, a thought experiment, may not be the right one, we need to make some serious uh, considerations to fundamental change. And I think that there are uh, three reasons for that. One is in the era in which we've had what Ed Glazer uh, called the triumph of the city, economic results have been terrible in America. Richard Florida wrote the book Rise of the Creative Class in 2002. Uh, he really uh, foretold the rise of these superstar cities powered by high talent creatives that like to densely cluster in these transit oriented walkable neighborhoods, et cetera. 17 years, 15 years later, he has written a book called The New Urban Crisis talking about the problems, the kind of the downsides that, that followed from some of that. He saw the positives, but he didn't necessarily see all the negatives coming. Since 2000, uh, economic growth has been terrible. Uh, Barack Obama was the first president since Herbert Hoover to never once hit 3% GDP growth. George W. Bush, he was just about as bad. His economic growth was dismal. In the 1980s and the 1990s, job growth in America averaged 1.9% per year. Since 2000, we've been averaging around half a percent per year. And inflation-adjusted median household incomes are lower today than they were in 2000. So when you look at anemic GDP growth, anemic job growth, and declining incomes, those are just bad results from the current regime. So something needs to change. The second thing is, these liberal cities have benefited from deliberate government policies around especially globalization. Saskia Sassen, the sociologist, uh, literally the, wrote the book, The Global City. She's the leading uh, international theorist on global cities. She talked about how globalization produced the famous flat world effect of Thomas Friedman that allowed factories and call centers and IT to be shipped all over the world to wherever the talent and the cost base would allow it to be done most efficiently. But she pointed out that it's a lot more complex to do business in countries all over the world than it is in just one country. And so spreading the supply chain all over the world created demands for new forms of complex financial and producer services in uh, things like international currencies, international contract law, international accounting, marketing. And these required a lot of highly specialized skills to produce, ones you couldn't get in just any cities. The people who could do those sorts of things tended to cluster together in a limited number of places like New York and Chicago that she labeled global cities. And so, in a sense, the rise of New York and Chicago in this global city came in part as a result of the decline of the Akrons of this world. The globalization that spread those factories all over the world, which was not the only factor, of course, leading to industrial decline. There was inefficiency gains, technology, et cetera. But certainly globalization played some role uh, is part of what fueled the rise of these cities. And people today like to think of globalization as something that just happened, like a meteorite that just hit the earth. It just, it just happened. Globalization, yes, there were uh, various forms of technological improvements that emerged out of the marketplace. Globalization was a deliberate government choice. NAFTA was government policy. That was federal government action. The Uruguay round of trade talks, government action. Uh, admitting China to the WTO, government action. Government has been a tremendous uh, promoter of globalization and these policies. The intellectual classes and cultural elite of America, which are disproportionately based in these global cities, have been the biggest cheerleaders for this system because they are the ones primarily benefiting from it. And so uh, I, don't think, I think that we have to look at the role globalization played in not just tearing some of these other places down, but in building up the global cities. And then uh, lastly, you know, there has been a lot of bespoke help for many of these cities. Washington is what Washington is in part because of the vast expansion of federal government into every nook and cranny of American life. Why, uh, New York has benefited enormously from Wall Street bailouts and from, shall we say, a uh, relaxed attitude towards prosecution of financial crime in the wake of the crash. Silicon Valley has accomplished what it accomplished in part because it has been given an exemption from all the ordinary business practices with which every other American industry has to comply. 
you know, ordinary American businesses can't just come into your town like Uber did and say, whatever your regulations, we're going to stop operating. Ordinary American businesses could not operate with the demographics of employees, of just young, white, and Asian males, like Silicon Valley has been able to get away with. So in a sense, they were just given, they didn't have to pay taxes on internet transactions for a long period of time. So there were specific bespoke government actions that benefited many of these cities. Deliberate government policies around globalization benefited them. And frankly, the era of dominance by these coastal superstar cities has just been a, a, an era of economic underperformance. So whatever the answer is, uh, it's time to uh, rethink. Ross? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I feel like I've been out contrarian tw twice, <laughs> twice, twice running. So I'm really, I'm really not sure what to say. Um, I, I feel like, I guess I'd make a, a couple of comments, which is just going to sort of, I, I got in an, sort of one online discussion briefly about um, one of the questions you raised about anemic growth, because I cited it. In the, in the original column saying, you know, whatever the sort of concentration effects of having all these knowledge workers living together, uh, they've produced anemic growth. Um, and Noah Smith, uh, who's an economist and blogger and frequent Twitterer, um, sent me a bunch of research arguing that in fact, um, you know, all things being equal, these cities are increasing growth and, you know, there's more growth in countries that have more of them and, and so on. And that, Basically, it's it's the argument that you know the, it could have been worse argument. Basically, <laughs> that global growth would be even more, or American Western growth would be even more anemic without these um, concentrations. So I feel like I'm not enough of a scholar of the literature to sort of adjudicate that case. But I think it's worth it's worth raising to sort of contrarian our contrarianism. Um, another another thing that's worth um, raising, I think, is the. Um, one of the fascinating things, and I don't have sort of an answer to this exactly, but I wrote, um, I co-wrote a book with Raihan Salam about 10 years ago that was sort of talking about at the very end in our, that book sort of version of our crackpot ideas. Um, you know, we were sort of talking about the future of the working class and the future of the American heartland and so on. And one of the things we said, this was 2005 when we started working on it and 2008 when it was published was, well, look, obviously the internet is going to be a great mechanism for potential decentralization. That basically you'll have lots of people who want to live in, you know, small, mid-sized American cities in, you know, the middle of America because housing is cheaper there and the cost of living is lower and so on and they'll be able to telecommute or, you know, or this a piece of a company can be spun off and sent out to you know, a different part of the country, and that'll be fine because the internet, right? The internet will, you know, enable sort of physical dispersion and might counteract this trend towards sort of the concentration of the hyper-educated. And that just hasn't happened. And of course, in fact, the reverse has sort of continued to happen. In fact, all the people who work in the most internet-enabled companies also want to be as close together to each other as possible, uh, you know, in, in Northern California now that means living in the town, you know, the sort of new company towns that are unlike the old company towns and that it's a lot harder to have kids in them. <laughs> but um, but it, it's just sort of interesting, I think, I, I don't, again, have sort of a full explanation for that, but it's just sort of an interesting fact of America in the age of the internet. You do have sort of, you do have dispersal. People do move continue to move to the Sun Belt and you know we talk about these sort of big coastal megalopolises but you know there's plenty of growth in Atlanta and Phoenix and all these sort of Texas Texan cities these sort of sprawling suburbanized cities that are more family friendly people keep moving to them but the sort of you know the hyper educated the knowledge workers this sort of this this sort of class has not done that the companies that they work for haven't done that the sort of new economy um, hasn't done that, hasn't dispersed. And it's just, there's an interesting sort of, I think, sociological and psychological story about why that is that I haven't completely figured out exactly. Um, but it's sort of part of the story here that the internet theoretically could geographically disperse us, but in fact has not exactly. Um, 
Should I say something more in defense of the suburbs? Is that is that is that useful or well, helpful? Or why don't you why don't you why don't you, you challenge why don't you challenge us for a minute? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I. Oh, you've got you're good. Right. Um, so I will challenge the defense of um, the suburbs to this degree, which is that um, the suburbs are certainly growing, um, and the Sun Belt is certainly growing, but they're also becoming more urban. And they are gathering people by becoming, as I was discussing before, uh, you know, a little denser, a little more walkable. And so there are two ways of talking about cities. Um, one is talking about New York City and its you know, large urban cores. And the other is talking about urbanism, which is urban form. And uh, you know, the work at the New Urbanism Initiative has always been focused on um, repairing urban form and showing that, in fact, um, the booming Texas cities, if you go to them, they are establishing downtowns. They are, um, you know, creating that walkable environment because that is what the market is demanding. And uh, even through American zoning, the market works its work. Um, now, and I also want to bring up what you mentioned about anemic economic growth, and um, Aaron might want to chime in here because there has been the barrage of studies from Ed Glazer, from uh, many others, who posit that we have had economic growth precisely because we have had such limited cities. Uh, cities are the economic engines of America right now, agglomeration effects, that lovely word um, just rolls off the tongue as you were talking about, um, allows that economic growth to roll forward. And we have frozen those cities with zoning. Um, so Aaron, should we deregulate the city? What, what would we get from that? Which is, after all, the free market position. Right. Well, in theory, if you have higher incomes available in some of these coastal cities, that should draw people from around the country to want to come there. Unfortunately, those uh, high wages are often offset by high housing costs, uh, which make it prohibitive to people. And so what you see is that these coastal cities have become progressively more and more elite in their character. Uh, New York is still the center of the financial world. Uh, but much of the finance industry, employment, and back office is being offloaded to places like Charlotte, uh, to Salt Lake City, where Goldman has a gigantic office. There was just an article in the journal uh, the other day about Denver uh, soaking up a lot of uh, finance jobs being outsourced out of San Francisco. So a lot of the, the lower and mid-value uh, are moving either offshore or to uh, kind of sunbelt boom towns. And these uh, urban areas are becoming more elite as they've effectively become frozen uh, thanks to building regulations. In San Francisco, uh, you cannot build anything as of right in the entire city, meaning you have to have special permission in order to build literally anything in the city. So definitely it would be uh, to great advantage to be able to build more and to be able to bring those housing prices down so more and more people could enter and we'd see a much more normally functional market. It's hard to see how that happens politically in those places. Uh, for a lot of people there, high housing prices are not a bug, they're a feature. Right? They, they are a form of functional exclusion that is still legal to pull off uh, in the United States, uh, at least for the time being, and so that's what they do to basically price people out. Secondly, a ton of people have uh, bought houses at these high prices, and therefore there would be tremendous destruction of wealth if there were, in fact, housing price decline. So anyone who owns uh, a condo or a home or property is going to fight tooth and nail uh, to keep it off. And then you're just in a pro-regulatory, uh, pro-red tape environment. So the dynamics kind of don't augur well for the kinds of, um, kinds of development that might relieve some of this pressure and break up some of this concentration through natural market forces. You also do see... Uh, but would I it, can, can I... Uh, this is, again... Yeah. Forget, so... But when you say break up the concentration, this is my sort of, I mean, if the unleashing market forces, though, in that sense, would not break up 
the concentration, it would bring jobs back from Salt Lake City and Denver, right, to San Francisco and New York, which would effectively, it, it, would, it would limit the concentration of sort of the uber wealthy, but it would bring the jobs it brought back would be still upper middle class, you know, high, highly educated jobs. So you would have, you would have a increased concentration in certain ways, and that would be more economically efficient, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have a, a sort of dispersive effect, right? right. Yeah, I mean, it, it would have sort of a, a I mean, again, it's speculative as right. to what would happen. It, it would probably have some sort of a dilutive effect. And a lot of these jobs that are moving to the Charlottes and the Salt Lake cities and the Dallases, these are the jobs that employ people who have families. You know, the married middle class um, family with children often commuting in from the suburbs. And having those kinds of people creating more diversity, demographic diversity in the city, as opposed to just having, you know, the uber rich kind of young singles and people that is probably good for the politics. It's good. You're just side by side working with people who are different. Uh, it, it kind of reduce. It would reduce something of this, you know, kind but of what, expense sorting. But what? But but what if those people become different people because they're living in San Francisco or New York, right? Instead of being the, you know, they say, all right, all right I want to start a family, but my job, you know, I, they it can keep me in New York. And I can afford to live here in a smaller apartment or home than I'd have in Charlotte. And so I get married a little later, and I have kids a little later, or not at all. And suddenly, I'm not, you know, I mean, this is just the question that I'm trying to wrestle with, right? The, the, those people then are less, like, it's nice to say, yes, we should have, you know, sort of s North Carolinian Republicans working cheek by jowl with big New York City Democrats. But those North Carolinian Republicans or centrist Democrats or whatever they would become would not be Republicans had they stayed in New York City and continued to work for their, for their company in their culture, potentially. Right, and they wouldn't even be, uh, the, uh, if they send their kids to the, the colleges and universities that the aspiring class wants to send their kids to, their kids will all. There isn't this this intense uh, acculturalization, you know. To fit in uh, is to uh, you know is, uh, you 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 want to at least be able to talk about uh, what you listen to on NPR on the way home. And if you are talking about that, there's a whole sort of mindset and worldview that comes with that. But I mean, I I wanted to ask you about this because I mean, um, I uh, my uh, my family. I, I I come from a long line of. Of, of back office workers in, in, uh, in finance and in law in New York. And those people never lived in Manhattan, or they didn't live in Manhattan for a very, very long time. I mean, if you wanted to, if you were, uh, I mean, first of all, those back office jobs didn't go from Manhattan to Charlotte. I think they probably went from Manhattan in the 70s to Jersey City, from Jersey City to, and, uh, and then from Jersey City to, to, to Charlotte. But, uh, you know, there, the city always was, uh, you know, for it. It's very hard to, you know, lead, lead a middle class family life in Manhattan. It's, you know, it's it's all but impossible. And it seems that with all with all this talk about how to revitalize uh, uh, major metropolitan areas, I think they begin and end with two words, which is public schools. I mean, the now, you know, New York has some terrific public schools, but they're 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 extraordinarily selective. They're extraordinarily, you know, they're 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 sort of reserved for the meritocracy. You would, I mean, you can't if if you're a uh, if you make one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year um, in Charlotte and you want to raise a family uh, and you want your kids to go to the same kinds of schools that they can go to in Charlotte. My God, that's a—I mean, you're, that's a revolution that that, that you have to have in Manhattan. Uh, so uh, I I just don't see that happening. Right, and well, well, it, it's tough. I mean, I, I would just I would push back on that. They, they will change you, but you will never change them. I mean, it's similar to immigration. Immigrants come to our country, and those immigrants are radically transformed generation by generation as they assimilate to the culture of the United States. However, they change the culture of our country as well. New York City's culture has been changed by the immigrants who came here. So it's, it's a two-way street. And that's true even when you're commuting in from the suburbs. 
And I agree that the, the prospect for change is not high right now, but to say that basically we're sort of doomed to have this high cost, elite, this kind of city full of effectively elite, very high end people, kind of young, you know, millennial type singles, very few families and immigrants, is to basically say structurally the commanding heights of the American economy and culture will be held forever uh, by essentially the left because you're writing off the cities politically in a sense because the, the demographics is kind of destiny on that point. The reason that these cities are so far to the left today is because demographics changed. The people who voted Giuliani in to the mayor's, mayor's office are either dead or in Florida. And so, uh, you, know, that, you know, the king can't afford queens anymore. You know, that kind of middle class voters gone. So, you know, if not this, then what? And I think is the question in, you know, is, is conservatism just gradually retreating from greater and greater spheres of America on that population wise? I, I think you got to be in the game. You got to be in the game. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to that, let us get in the game of uh, some questions from the audience here. Um, let's see, we should have a microphone that is able to go around uh, this young man over here. <laughs> there seem to have been uh, something like two tracks of the conversation about new urbanism today, specifically uh, the global cities, major megalopolises, and also these kind of secondary, uh, whether that be Dallas or Charlotte or others that we've referenced a lot. And uh, the relationship between them has been maybe perhaps a little hazy, but I wonder if we could also introduce uh, how new of new urbanism can we get? Is there an opportunity um, to look to instead of, uh, there's a degree of resignation about some of these larger cities um, and perhaps rather than uh, looking to them for our hopes of revitalizing urban life or uh, Detroit's or whatever, are there smaller cities that could perhaps develop as well that like we could look to um, new urban centers with new cultural dynamics uh, just kind of bypassing some of the troubles of the moment. May I jump in with this? Jump away. I, I, I'm wondering, uh, as far as your the the first part of your question, um, uh, and this uh, speaks to the point that you were just raising. Um, the uh, uh, a town I know well, and I, I Ross, you must know this town. Um, uh, at least indirectly, because it seems half the New York Times works, uh, lives there rather, is Montclair, New Jersey. I'm uh, familiar with yes. it. Yes. Uh, um, Montclair, New Jersey has become, over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, it was always a leafy, um, liberal, high minded suburb of New York. Um, but it had it it it, it had um, uh, its it share of country club Republicans. Um, it has become, uh, it is, it, you know, it is essentially. Uh, where the um, uh, 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 journalists and uh, uh, labor lawyers and all sorts of lawyers, journalists, uh, and everyone in publishing moves to when they're priced out of Manhattan. I mean, it's not for it's not for poor people, it, but it, it and, and and it's not for the uh, you know it's it's not for secretaries. Uh, it's for uh, working journalists and 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 the the few book publishers uh, who, who, who remain employed. So that, um, <laughs> but, so you're well, having the though. industry is in better shape than the journalism. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a, a what, you're ha what you have in the case of Montclair is um, a, a uh, you could say the cancer is spread, uh, if you wanted to, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of elite liberal uh, mindset and values, um, but then I was just I was spent part of the summer. Um, my my son goes to a, a, a fancy prep school in New England, and at the end of the school, he said, "I, I need to get as far as, as far away from this place as possible. We have to go to the South." So I took him to the South, and we spent some time in um, Chattanooga and Knoxville. And I don't know if, if any of you. I are, was just in uh, that region this weekend. Ah, yes. You know, very, very, very new urbany. Very, in, in a way, very new urbany. I mean, not so, uh, Chattanooga. I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about Chattanooga because that seems to be a place that's kind of, you know, really kind of on the cusp. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of gritty, but kind of really kind of hip. And isn't that the problem? It's hip. It's like, you know, there's a lot of, and I'm, I'm wondering, I'm thinking, 
who are, there is some young money here. There's people with the, you know, disposable incomes. I don't know what they're doing. I saw some web design thing. I don't know what people do anymore. You know, industrial <laughs> design, I don't know. But, but, I don't, but the problem is, I, again, this is Chattanooga. If Chattanooga is becoming a, a much more interesting, lively, vibrant, it's that word again, place, but it's all just young people without kids. Uh, so I don't know even, in, you know, this is Chattanooga. You know, I don't, if it's not going to work in Chattanooga, I don't know where it's going to work. And again, it won't work in Chattanooga until families can think that they can raise their kids and educate their kids there. Yeah, Aaron, let me uh, ask you to bring in some of your perspective from having lived in Indianapolis, because we know some of the same people around there. And Indianapolis uh, downtown has encountered some of the same, uh, you know, revival that Chattanooga has. What was the experience there? Were there, was it, chi- was it a childless city? Well, uh, what I would say is if you go to a city like Indianapolis, it's dramatically different from New York. First, if you, I just go around to events in, in cities I travel to and look at how many people are wearing wedding rings. And in New York, it's like a minority. I mean, in Manhattan, you walk around and look at how many people on the streets have wedding rings. It's not that many. It's a a tremendous number of single people. In Manhattan, you go to a city like Indianapolis, uh, 75% plus uh, of the people are married. So there's there's, there's certainly much more married couples. Definitely, you know, there are, there are issues with urban schools and people raising their families in urban schools. But the primary population base in cities like that is suburban. You know, these cities have, to the extent that they have kind of an urban, walkable, dense neighborhoods, they're very small. They have nothing like New York City density or San Francisco density. And so these are kind of regions that are definitely still shaped, you know, by uh, the family by married couples, by people with children. And that doesn't always mean, I think one of, one of the things to keep in mind here, this doesn't always just mean Republican. Those, that demographic does tend to shift Republican. But you know, I know, uh, you know very echo conscious, urban, uh, lefty families with children. And they just have a different sensibility and a different set of priorities at a different voice to the city. So even people who have a different political persuasion, uh, I think who have children, just bring a different conversation to the city about a priority about how do we design the city and, and what is it for. But, but definitely when you travel to other cities, you see a tremendous difference in you know, percentages of people who are married and percentages of people who have kids. So it doesn't seem that the presence of kids um, and the presence of marrieds with kids inhibits or means that you are not getting that urban vitalization. And in fact, many people... Um, who are engaged in that process, are engaged in that process precisely for their kids. Well, I just have to challenge you on, 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 on all of this. Uh, first, I would say that, I mean, as you pointed out, they're using the downtown. They're using that, you know, they want to go on Saturday night and they want to walk around kind of a... Um, uh, a Disneyland version of an urban space. You know, they don't, they're not living there, they're living in the suburbs, as you said. You know, so that's where, I mean, they're living in the suburbs because that's where the schools are, the schools are, that's where they have to raise their kids. Sure, they might, you know, they might want to live in that hip loft space over the, you know, um, over the coffee shop, but that's very expensive, and again, where are they going to send their kids? And then the problem is, and I guess I'm a- addressing mostly a conservative audience, and, and, and cons- the conservative and Republican, you know, we can, uh, the, you can draw, you know, find distinctions, but it's, the problem is, and I think Ross will support the following assertion, the people who are adhering to family and religious values, who are raising, who are, um, uh, who are raising their kids in, um, in, in stable uh, uh, families. Uh, no divorce, essentially no divorce. It's, the, it's, it's, it's those uber-talented urbanites. Now, some of them are Republicans, some of them are Democrats, as, as, as you pointed out. But it's the, you know, it, it is that group that is, um, you know, that is adhering to family values. And you know, church going, for instance, is, is much stronger among the, um, the economic elite than it is uh, for the country at large. All right. 
Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, right here in the middle. Thank you. Um, so I come from Texas. I'm from a suburb of Dallas, Texas. And I have to say just briefly, I have never seen a doggy water fountain until I went to Alexandria. So I, I texted my mom. I was like, Mom, there's, they have doggy water fountains. Um, and she said, that's, that's the thing. Americans don't have kids. Uh, so, but, but the other thing I think we haven't talked about, the sort of elephant in the room, or maybe not in this room, is crime. Um, when we talk about where people want to raise their kids, you want to raise your kids in an area where you can be sure that when they're walking down the street, something won't happen to them. I think it's pretty crass when people talk about Chicago and use that as any sort of talking point about gun control. But it's a real point, right, that, uh, that people want to have kids and raise kids in a, in a place where you know that they're going to be safe. And so at the same time, we're seeing this movement against the one thing that we know does decrease crime, which is more police presence. So what do you guys have to say to making cities livable? Um, what does that look like? Politically speaking, how do we be the ones arguing for more cops when we know that's the only real thing that actually uh, decreases crime? And have I just like stepped into something here? <laughs> well, that's a... That's a... It's, yeah, Russ, care to close us out on uh, on, on how to how to solve race and crime in America? No, it's no, but you're right that there there is there is a, a uh, an evasion around some of the issues we've talked about. And just to speak from personal experience, you know, we lived on Capitol Hill, which is um, and became much more so over the time we lived there, a highly gentrified, highly educated DC neighborhood. Um, with increasingly several good public schools um, that were good up through like fourth or fifth grade that parents had mm -hmm. sort of, you know, gone in and sort of changed the culture of the school and so on and were sending their kids there. Um, and, you know, and crime has obviously gone down in American cities dramatically over the last 20 years. Uh, but there was still, was still and is still a lot of crime in Capitol Hill. Um, and our car was stolen and taken on a joyride into Alexandria, where, um, <laughs> where it was found. And the cops called up and said, uh, so we're going through the items in the car. And now, do you guys own the brass knuckles? <laughs> like, well, sometimes Krugman and I get into it. And, you know, um, sorry. Um, so, you know, that happened. There was a murder five blocks down from our house on Christmas Eve. Um, you know, my wife's friend was mugged. I mean, you know, I can go on with incidents in the time we lived there. And that, you know, was, it was not the only factor, but once we had small children, that was a factor in our decision that we now regret <laughs> to move out, to move out of the city. Um, and it was a factor in, it's also just a factor sort of, you know, when we're talking about like the Jane Jacobs image too, right? It's like, you let your children play, you let them roam your neighborhood and so on. All of that all of that plays a, it plays a big role in these dynamics. And, you know, the, you, I mean, you asked a specific policy question. I mean, I think the, there is, in fact, a kind of actual policy sweet spot, but it's a hard one to hit, which is that, um, uh, you know, you, you, need a, you need urban police forces that are both, that are more numerous and more restrained in certain ways. Um, and that, uh, that the sort of, uh, you know, the left and libertarian critique of police practices, especially as white urbanites have moved to reclaim these cities, is a legitimate critique. And the, you know, the sort of worst case scenarios that turn into, the, turn into these trials and get caught on video and so on, all of that is a real part of this, you know, this sort of tension of gentrification, among other things, that you have this sort of, this sort of stop and frisk mentality among cops is part of what makes people, you know, let's be honest, white upper middle class people feel comfortable living in these neighborhoods that they feel like the cops are doing these things. But at the same time, you know, I remember from my own time in Capitol Hill reading online sort of listservs and Twitter threads of people saying, uh, you know, the, you know, white people moved in down the street from me and started calling the cops on me when I'd take a walk. You know, like that's, that's a reality too. And it's, you know, it, again, ra issues of race in America are extremely difficult to handle and finesse. But I do think that there, there is a lot of data on sort of police 
presence and numbers as a deterrent to crime that could be effectively, and you know, is effectively put to use by some police departments. But I think you could, you could have a world with less crime, more police, and less sort of overt stop and frisk. That, that is imaginable based on what I can tell about crime policy. Is it actually achievable, and especially in the current climate, it's harder for me to say. But I think that, you know, that issue, I mean, when we were talking about the 50s and 60s and 70s and sort of suburban flight and so on, obviously, you know, the role of crime gets bigger and bigger in the 60s and 70s as the crime wave builds. But even before the 60s and 70s, even when crime rates are very low, you know, crime rates in urban areas in the 50s are as low as early 50s or as low as, low as at any point in American history, they're still much higher than in the suburbs. And people who are having kids are inevitably going to take that into account and find something attractive about being in neighborhoods where, like the neighborhood we live in now and will soon leave, where, you know, I mean, one of our, one of our intimates who thinks we're making a mistake by going back to walkable urbanism will occasionally tell us that we're moving to crime haven. Um, you know, so it's all these, these issues, yeah, they're tough. Um, and they will not cease <laughs> being tough or being discussed. Um, I, I want to just briefly thank again the American Conservative and Hillsdale for having us here. I want to thank Ross, Ben, and Aaron for joining us. Um, and I want to encourage everyone to continue reading the people that have been up here today because the question of cities and of the ways in which we live together are getting, if, on, if anything, just more and more relevant. And there is some fantastic work being done on that by people who have been on this panel um, and others. So please give, help me give a round of applause. Live longer, and if you don't have one to start out your life, you're very likely to end up uh, with one. And women are the caretakers in American society. They take care of the children with disabilities and loved ones with disabilities. And so it's an issue that they can't hide from even if they wanted to. And uh, Clarence talked about the people in, uh, who are incarcerated and how many of them have uh, disabilities of one kind or another. And that uh, percentage is, is extremely high for women who are incarcerated. I think it's close to 50%. So uh, this is uh, a women's issue, and you know, back in the day, if it was a women's issue, it would be shoved off into the corner, and maybe you'd have one or two champion lawmakers who would uh, go to bat for you. But women's issues are actually in vogue today. Uh, corporations are want to cater to women. We have buying power. We have voting power, and so I think um, women. Uh, own this issue, and uh, that can be a very good thing. I think we have just one more question, then we're going to have to wrap it up. Yes? My question is for the general, is for the panel in general. I'm a proud uh, two-year uh, uh, policy fellow for respectability. I've uh, I was diagnosed with um, Asperger's syndrome when I was 15 years old, and for the past decade and a half uh, plus, uh, we've seen a lot of advances uh, uh, in disability rights and issues uh, f for the better. But um, in my opinion, we're still not yet there. But my question is this: uh, um, <laughs> respectability. There's a there's a gr there's a growth uh, toward. Uh, shall we say, catch-all uh, movement uh, toward catch-all uh, in the disability movement, uh, meaning uh, moving away from individual organizations that deal with the individual differences like uh, autism or cerebral palsy um, uh, because of the concern that uh, we're putting people in, as we say, like to say, silos. So uh, how, does, how would an organization uh, that is catch-all and, and, and works to cater to people with disabilities, how can we get the balance of uh, uh, of not putting people in the silos but uh, 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 dealing with with uh, dealing with uh, uh, getting the individual needs uh, done because the typical person on on the autism spectrum 
often, more often than not needs their social needs to be addressed. Someone with with uh, spina bifida, for example, needs their physical needs to be ad to be addressed, and et cetera. How do you how how do you, does one achieve that balance, even though the end goal is all the same? Sounds like a Meg question. <laughs> I feel like I've d been doing all the talking, so I didn't want to jump in. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of companies start with uh, autism or neurodiversity movements, and it, it's um, kind of the hot thing right now. And so uh, we see, and we encourage companies, start where you're comfortable, start where you are. And usually most uh, corporate initiatives begin with someone that has a passion a around the topic and maybe has a connection to somebody with a disability. So when you think about the SAP program, that was started because there was a father of someone who had autism, and so they started autism hiring. And then that has spun off to Microsoft and other organizations doing it. And now you've got um, and CR out of Atlanta who has a neurodiversity initiative. They didn't want to just focus on individuals with, with autism or Asperger's. They wanted to focus on what makes your brain different and it's how you learn, if you're a stroke survivor, all the other things that make your brain different. So we're seeing those bigger movements happening around, um, but we do encourage companies to do cross disability hiring, make sure that the infrastructure supports are needed, um, are in place for all disabilities, whether it's physical barriers. Um, I went into a company with uh, a friend of mine who is a wheelchair user, and it was a company that was touting about their disability initiatives, and she went to use the restroom, had to come out and say, your bathrooms are not accessible. So th there are things like that that seem very basic, but um, you know, it's, it's about looking at the full spectrum and what parts of your organization does it touch uh, the individual with disability, and are you truly giving them full access, just like everybody else would have. Yeah, I, um, I want to uh, thank uh, the folks uh, in the audience that uh, you know, attended the uh, conversations today. I uh, want to thank my uh, fellow board colleagues that are in attendance. And uh, you know, if I must say so, uh, I am very optimistic about uh, the future of uh, you know, uh, disability uh, you know, discourse in this country, uh, mainly because of um, you know, the work of my fellow board colleagues and uh, you know, the work and the insight of uh, you know, the uh, panelists here today and, um, you know, and also to uh, the work of our uh, senior fellows such as uh, Sinea Dave and uh, some of the other senior fellows that are actually present with us here today. So again, I want to thank uh, Eleanor Cliff, uh, Sinea Dave, uh, Meg O'Connell, and uh, Clarence Page uh, for being here with us today and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. This, could, this is going to be wrapping up our program. I just want to say thank you to our new chairman, uh, Cal Harris, and I want to remind everyone on C-SPAN that Respectability is a relatively new organization. We're only four years old. You can check us out at respectability.org, and we're on Facebook and Twitter. We're currently looking for national leadership fellows, that's young leaders with and without disabilities who want to work with us to fight stigmas and, and advance opportunities for people with disabilities. It's been a terrific day. The speakers throughout the day have been phenomenal. Mark Summers, phenomenal to have you with us. And Donna and everybody who spoke and the crowd who's with us is just amazing. But those who are with us on C-SPAN, you didn't know what you were gonna get to watch today. We hope that you were really inspired and that you will join us in this effort. So I do invite you, check us out online, respectability.org. We're looking for volunteers. We're going to be out in California working on Hollywood issues with a really great initiative in Long Beach, California to work on jobs for people with disabilities. So if you want to get involved, get in touch. We'd love to have you. Um, again, a new organization. The future is bright for people with disabilities. Steve Tingus and everybody who's with us, Thank you so much. And I just want to say, Congressman Brad Sherman is amazing for helping us get this room and organize this event. Lauren Applebaum put together so many details. The fellows under the direction of uh, Christopher and Ben and Hillary Steen and Philip Polly from our staff. You guys are all rock stars. So 
I just want to say really thank you to all of you. And I want to invite all of our speakers and all of our board members and our staff and fellows who are currently here, if I can invite you to the front so we can take a picture. But thank you to everyone who joined us via C-SPAN or here in person. Coming up in the morning, the Senate Finance Committee will look into ways to increase affordable housing in America. Our live coverage begins at 10 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN, online at cspan.org, and streaming on the free C-SPAN radio app. We have been on the road meeting winners of this year's Student Cam Video Documentary Competition. At East Lyme High School in East Lyme, Connecticut, second prize winners Jack McDonald, Mikhail Guzman, and Victoria Chong were handed $1,500 for their documentary on environmental justice. And then at East Lyme Middle School, honorable mention winners Canon Dean, Sachi Vora, and Jasper Wright received $250 for their documentary on health care. And then to Concord, Massachusetts, to hand out a second prize award to students at the Neshoba Brooks School, where Cara Fritz, Charlotte Lisa and Caroline Drapeau won a second place prize of $1,500 for their documentary on the wage gap. In Northampton, Massachusetts, students from Northampton High, Phoebe Jessup and Elena Fragamini won an honorable mention prize of $250 for their documentary on sanctuary cities and immigration reform. And in Ludlow, Massachusetts, Kendall Vermette, Liz Gonzalez, and Braden Vermette of Paul R. Baird Middle School received an honorable mention prize of $250 for their documentary on the opioid epidemic. Thank you to all the students who took part in our 2017 Student Cam Documentary Competition. To watch any of the videos, go to studentcam.org. And Student Cam 2018 starts in September with the theme, The Constitution and You. We're asking students to choose any provision of the U.S. Constitution and create a video illustrating why the provision is important. Vice President Pence met with the leaders of Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia yesterday. Afterwards, he talked to reporters, touching briefly on Russia's recent actions. Here's what he had to say. President Kalilai, thank you for your warm welcome and the hospitality you've shown to me and my family. And to you, uh, to President Veyonis and to President Griboskaitia, it is an honor to be with you today with the leaders of the Baltic State. And it's my great privilege to be here today to bring a very simple message from the President of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. President Trump sent me here to say, we are with you. We stand with the people and nations of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and we always will. Next year marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of freedom for all three of your nations. But for most of this past century, you had to fight to reclaim your independence and your sacred birthright of liberty. The United States proudly stood with you as you labored under communist occupation. Through all the decades, we refused to recognize the Baltic states as part of the Soviet Union. When you raised your voices in the singing revolution, we joined the chorus from afar for liberty. When you joined your hands in the Baltic way, we reached out from across the world. And the people of the United States believed with you that the Baltic states would one day reclaim your rightful place among the community of free and sovereign nations. And so you did. 
Today you have achieved that goal and more by acceding to the European Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's a particular honor to be here in Estonia with the advent of your presidency of the Council of the European Union. The United States joined you in your call, in your leadership role in the EU for stronger internal security and external borders, a more robust partnership between the EU and NATO, and increased European defense spending. And as I told these three presidents today, President Trump and I applaud each of their unwavering commitment to our NATO alliance. Estonia is only one of five nations to meet its obligation to spend a minimum of 2% of their gross domestic product on defense. And Latvia